This is Thanksgiving month, so we're going to begin by singing a traditional Thanksgiving hymn, 793, For the Beauty of the Earth. If you would, let's stand together as we sing. For the on hymn number 159 is the beautiful chorus great are you lord holy lord most holy lord sing it together holy lord most holy lord you alone are worthy of my singing this morning. Let's pray together. Pastor Pete. Let's pray. Father, you are our holy, awesome, and majestic God. We want to lift up your great and glorious name because you are worthy of it, Lord. You're worthy of everyone around us knowing who you are and that we desire to worship you with every breath that we have. So may our worship continue in this place during this hour. May we be reminded of that empty tomb and that Christ suffered and died and rose again for us because he loved us so much. We praise in Christ's name. Amen.
Please be seated. They watched as soldiers nailed their Savior to a tree. They witnessed all the anguish, all the agony. They waited for his Father to rescue him, but then he cried out, it is finished, and they knew it was the end. The stone that sealed the tomb had finally sealed their fate. For all their hopes now laid within that borrowed grave. Left with only questions, they pondered all he said. But answers didn't matter, for now their Lord was dead. They began their final walk to say their last goodbyes. But when they reached the tomb, they could not believe their eyes when they found nothing. They found everything in an empty tomb they realized what christ himself had prophesied that death would never hold their king when they found nothing they found everything. Oh, hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb who conquered death and hell, who died and rose again. When they found nothing, they found everything. They realized what Christ himself had prophesied death could not hold our king they found everything when they found nothing they found everything. Oh, we do praise the Lord for the blessed hope of the resurrection of God that we have in Christ Jesus. And uh, it's, it's what separates us from all other religions. Our Savior lives. And this, we have uh, many of our fellow believers all across the world today that are suffering for the cause of, cause of Christ. And today is our international day of, the, of, of prayer for the persecuted church. So we've asked Rick Jaden to come right now to say a few words about that and introduce a video we want to show and then actually lead us in prayer for that. 
for the rear. As a way to focus our attention on these dear brothers and sisters that are suffering for the cause of Christ, as a way to stir us up by way of remembrance to what the scripture says. We'll watch the video and then I'll ask that, listen to the spirit of God as he prepares you and we'll all together pray as a church for these dear ones that are suffering for their faith.
All right, we're going to pray together. How many of you, <clears throat> the Bible says that God had delivered us from this present evil world. How many of you glad this morning that you're delivered? Say amen. amen. Many of you will recall when Jesus prayed, he prayed to the Father that for men like you and I, young and old, here and across the world, Jesus prayed that God the Father would not take them out of the world, but what? But keep them. Yeah. So with that in our hearts, let's pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters, young and old, around the world. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you so grateful for who you are. So many things, Lord, you've sent the Comforter. We know you, Lord, as the God of mercies and the God of all comfort. And we now intercede for so many. Lord, I'm ashamed that I don't pray more, but we have these reminders from Scripture by your Spirit, newsletters from missionaries like Alpha Ministries and Brother Benny and just so many other places. We are comforted when we know that where there is suffering, you are there. And men and women of God, filled with the Spirit of God, little ones are there representing you. So now we do want to pray for those brothers and sisters that are persecuted. First of all, Lord, I pray that they would feel your presence in the midst of their suffering. I know in my own life, sometimes you feel you're all alone and you're, you're isolated. So I, I pray for each one. Remind them that they're not alone. Besides you, besides your spirit, there are others like us praying for them. Strengthen them, Lord that they might be able to endure and persevere in their faith and more, more than endure and persevere, but grow and prosper and overcome. We pray, even as your spirit says, for the peace of God, let the peace of God rule in their hearts. And I pray that your love, your perfect love would cast out all fear, like you said. We, I pray for what I called the Universal Church, all of us all over the world, for a greater awareness of the suffering of our brothers and sisters. And that I remember Jesus said that we might all be one as you, Father, are one with the Lord Jesus. So in that oneness, in that unity, in that same spirit that lives in us and is in them, Lord, help us to bear ye one another's burdens, like you said. So awareness that we would pray more. I do pray for their protection the, of families and communities that are suffering beatings and loss and being cast out of community, especially those that are pregnant or sick or the elderly thou knowest. Just comfort them, strengthen them, and I pray for their protection. I pray for the communities around them all that our brothers and sisters would live in such a way that they would have your favor and see God reflected in them. I pray for those that are actually persecuting our brothers and sisters, the little ones, the, the beatings and the suffering, the, the evil words. The, I pray for them that, that as they look upon these dear ones, that they themselves would be, would hear the, rep the reproof of God and 
the judgment of God and, and they would turn to you by faith. I pray that you'd save souls as a result that you might be glorified in all this suffering. And I even pray for these nations where these dear ones are because you said to pray for those in authority. I pray for those in authority that you do such a work saving souls and creating like we have here at least a freedom for our brothers and sisters to serve you without fear. I pray you do a work there that we might, they might be able to live in peace and serve you and love you. So there's so much to pray for, Lord, and I trust that you hear the prayers of my brothers and sisters and your spirit is interceding and that our prayer collectively is after the heart of Almighty God. To, to the end of it all, that you might be glorified. And I ask this by faith now, on behalf of all these gathered, in Jesus' name, amen. It's amazing to think about what these people have committed to in, in uh, just risking their lives and giving their lives for the cause of Christ. And in, the least that we can do is pledge our allegiance to the Lamb. Let's sing about that right now, if you would. Let's stand together. It's hymn number 600 in our hymnal, if you want to use that. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Let's pray over our offering today. Father, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with, all that you've provided for us. We want to give back to you now a portion in honor of who you are for your service, Lord, that you would take this offering and, and magnify it and multiply it for the furtherance of your kingdom, both here locally in this place, but also around, our world, around the world as we support our missionaries. May your kingdom be advanced. May your church be furthered and may your gospel go throughout all the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is where we are today. If you all turn your Bibles to John chapter 13, we're going to be looking at this new passage for us today. We finally made it out of John chapter 12 after nine weeks, and uh, we'll see how long chapter 13 takes. But before the message this morning, uh, Kate Jewett and Emma Sudd will come to sing, He Knows My Name. Thank you, ladies. Isn't it wonderful that our God knows us? It's not just that he knows about you, but he knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. For some people, that's easier to count than others. But he knows us so intimately. We have, um, we'll be looking today at John chapter 13, verses 1 to uh, 11. We'll see how much we get through today. I plan to take this section in two weeks. We may take it in three. Although, Kathy told me that since we gained an hour last night, I get to preach for an extra hour this morning. So, you didn't tell me that? <laughs> John chapter 13, uh, Jesus has ended his public ministry and he's now focusing on his own, on his that have received him. He's done away with those that have rejected him. He's now looking at those that have received him. And we see, the, uh, we see love's display of humility. Love's display of humility in this passage. I've been excited to get to this passage for a long time uh, because it's such a majestic picture of the humility of love. See, we need to have love in action. Newspaper columnists and 
Minister John Crane tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. She said, I, don't, I do not want to only be rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. So Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. He says, go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait he has. Go out of your way to be kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe that you really do love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love, that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. So with revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? This is going to be majestic, awesome. And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if she truly loved him. For two months, she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. But when she didn't return, Dr. Crane called her and asked her, said, are you ready to go through with the divorce now? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as by oft-repeated deeds. It's when we put our love into action that we truly express what love is. Over the course of his earthly ministry, Jesus gave four major discourses. The first one is probably the most well-known. It's the teaching of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, where he teaches us how to live a life that pleases God. We see that in Matthew chapter 5, verse, uh, chapter five through 7. The second one is the parable of the, the mystery of the parables discourse. In Matthew chapter 13, this is where he tells about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is such is, is like, and he gives parables to tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. The third great discord is the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew chapter 24 and 25, he tells us about the future, what is to come hereafter. And the fourth great discourse is this one that begins here in chapter 13. It's the Upper Room Discourse, where he gives his final teaching to his own. And it's, it's interesting, as we read through uh, John chapter 13 to 17, ending with chapter 17, Christ's high priestly prayer, we see everything in this teaching revolves around love. So he begins by expressing his love. J. Vernon McGee points out that the Gospel of John can be divided into three sections. The first 12 chapters, the subject is, is light, uh, where he tells, uh, they, they tell of his public ministry and that he is the light. The vision that we call the Upper Room Discourse, chapter 13 to 17, is about the subject of love. The last part of the gospel, chapter 18 to 21, is about life, that he came to bring us life, that life is in himself that our life comes through his death. So we're looking at the subject of love. The first main point of here is that uh, we, we see the action. Jesus shows love to his disciples. He shows a, a display of humility to his disciples. He says, this is what real love looks like. So we see first under here the setting of the supper. The setting of the supper. Let's read down through uh, verse 5. And it's probably what we'll end up covering today. It says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had have had given all things into his hand that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Such a 
humble display of love. We see first the setting of the supper. We see this in six parts. There are six parts mentioned in the first uh, three verses about what is happening here. We see first that Jesus knew in verse 1 that his hour was come. We saw this in, in the previous chapter, chapter 12. His hour that he had long been awaiting for. The hour when he would be glorified. When he was to lay down his life as a penalty as the, for the penalty for sin. When he was to be resurrected and returned to the Father. That hour has finally come. It's come to the point of his sacrifice and his resurrection. He is fully here in his hour, and this is the last teaching, the last example, the last illustration that he can give to his disciples. He knew that his hour was come. Secondly, Jesus loved his, known, his own unto the end. John MacArthur points out that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the supreme expression of love. It's the passage, the chapter on love. It defines what godly, true self-sacrificing, giving love looks like. Like that's the supreme expression of love. The Lord Jesus Christ is then the supreme example of love. In this passage, John chapter 15, the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus says, No greater love hath a man than this, and he lay down his life for his friends. Ephesians 5.25 uh, often a verse that we reference in reference to husband because it talks about husband. It says, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? How did he show that love for the church? He gave himself for it. Husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. First John 3.16, hereby we perceive the love of God. Here's how we even understand the love of God. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm sorry, that was, I jumped to Ephesians. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Sometimes I can't read on the same line. Another way to put this verse is that he loved his own, he loved his disciples, those that he came to rescue. He loved them to completion. He loved them perfectly. Yes, it's true that God loves the world full of sinners. We see this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and 45 talk about this. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That, verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Because your Father loves those who hate Him. That's what He says, for He makes the sun to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Just as God loves His enemies, we too are to love our enemies. Titus chapter 3, verse 4, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. God loves, yes, the whole world, but He also loves His own. He loves the world totally. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But for his own, he loves us with a perfect, complete, eternal, redeeming love that surpasses understandings. That is, understanding, that's what Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. What a fantastic passage. Starts out, Who? Or what? Is there anything that can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves his own perfectly. He loves us completely. He loves us to the end. It's very interesting in looking at this passage. I couldn't help but coming back to one of my favorite passages of Scripture. That is Philippians chapter 2. 
we see here, Philippians chapter 2, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Just as God loves us, we are then to love each other. So we see that Jesus knew his hour was come. Jesus knew that Jesus loved his own to the end. We see, verse 2, that the supper was ended. Now, when we read that in the English, we think, oh, well, they had supper, it's over, and now he's going to talk. But that's, that's not exactly how it is in the Greek. In the Greek, it's literally saying the supper was being in progress. Or during the supper, as things were continuing on with the supper, this was taking place during the Passover feast. feast before Jesus took the elements of the feast and transformed them, connecting, connecting them to the new parts, the new Lord's Supper, communion, while the meal was taking place, what were the disciples doing? Well, they were once again, as we see in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, they were once again arguing over who was the greatest amongst them and who was be the most prominent in heaven. While Jesus is about to show them what true humility looks like, the 12 disciples are back there saying, oh, Jesus loves me most. I'm the greatest amongst us, therefore everybody else needs to serve me. I'm not, I'm not going to be the, the servant. You guys need to be the servant. I am the greatest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit at God's right hand because I'm the greatest of the disciples. I'm the greatest of Jesus' own, and therefore I am the best. And they're arguing over this. And can you hear, hear them like children? No, uh, yaha, no, uh, yaha, no, uh, yaha. You're not the best, I'm the best. No, uh, drives you nuts that's what they were doing and that's the setting of what the disciples were involved in fourth we see the devil put betrayal into Judas, Judas's heart verse 2 and supper being ended the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot Simon's son to betray him Judas was already having those thoughts he had already made the decision said you know what as soon as this, this supper's over I'm done I'm saying goodbye to Jesus. I'm going to go make money where I can. I'm tired of this religious teacher who had the opportunity to seize political control in Israel and set it aside. That's not what I signed up for. Therefore, I'm going to go to the chief priest. I'm going to betray him. They can pay me a good 30, silver, 30 shekels of silver. That's good money. I'm not letting this pass by. Wow. Judas had those thoughts, and Satan was putting those thoughts in his heart. They're both culpable for this decision. They are co-conspirators in the death of Christ. So it's not that Satan said, oh, I'm going to take over you. He will enter, he will possess Judas shortly. But it's really just the temptation. Oh, hey, wouldn't you rather have more money than Jesus? Wouldn't you rather have the things that you desire Rather than following after Christ who is poor and penniless. It's the same kind of lust that we all face. That same kind of desire that every human faces. Five, we see that Jesus knew all things were given into his hands. The statement makes it, uh, the statement makes what Jesus is about to do even more astounding. All things, all power and authority and dominion is his. God the Father says, Jesus, it's all yours. You have the ultimate authority in the universe. I'm giving it to you. We see this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, he was God. Thought it not robbery you be equal with God. He didn't say, well, I have to take the next step. I have, to, I have to reach the next level of enlightenment. I have to do the next temple worship to become a God, like the Mormons teach. He was God. All authority was his. And what does he do? He humbles himself to serve. He shows love. The sixth, sixth part of the setting Jesus knew where he came from and where he was going. Verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. Jesus knew he was about to leave and return to the Father. But before he goes, he wants to impress upon his disciples the importance of humility, 
of service and show them what true strength looks like. So let's look at this. We see point B, the service of the Savior. The service of the Savior. Verse 4, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherein he was girded. This is such an amazing thing. Uh, let me grab this. This is one of my favorite children's books to read. It's the Jesus Storybook Bible. I've read through it, I don't know how many times with my kids. It, it doesn't give every account in the Bible, but it gives a great overarching story of what the Bible is about. It gives truth. And it's, it's fantastic. I love reading it to my kids. But in this one chapter on the servant king that talks about this passage, I, I wanted to read it to you because, well, it brings the point to a, uh, to a good head. Uh, it says, the servant king, it was Passover, the time when God's people remembered how God had rescued them from being slaves in Egypt. Every year they killed a lamb and ate it. The lamb died instead of us, they would say. But this Passover, God was getting ready for an even greater rescue. Jesus and his friends were having the Passover meal together in an upstairs room. But Jesus' friends were arguing. What about? They were arguing about stinky feet. Stinky feet? Yes, that's right. Stinky feet. Now the thing about feet back then was that, when people, that, was that people didn't wear shoes, they only wore sandals which might not sound unusual. I know many people today love to wear sandals. Except that the streets in those days were dirty. And I don't mean just dusty dirty. I mean really stinky dirty. With all those cows and horses everywhere, you can imagine the stuff on the street that ended up on their feet. So anyway, someone had to wash away the dirt. But it was a dreadful job. Who on earth would ever dream of volunteering to do it only the lowliest of servants. And here's the pictures if you want to see the pictures. We often think of our streets today as being fairly clean. You go for a walk down your street and sure, you might have to, on the, the curbside, if somebody clean, didn't clean up after their dog, you might have to dodge that, but that's about it. Uh, you ever walk behind a parade? Especially a parade with horses in it? You have to have somebody come along shoveling after them. That's all their streets. So the first step of coming together for a meal, especially a meal as significant as the Passover, you washed your feet. You came in. But, I mean, they didn't have chairs like we have today. We, we, um, we'll use a chair for this. But when we sit down at a meal, we sit down and our feet are down on the floor, right? But they didn't have that. They were literally on a low table with cushions. They were reclining basically on the floor. So everybody would kind of have their feet either away from the table or next to somebody else. And if you've got stink on your feet, you don't want that right next to somebody's face as you're getting ready to eat. That, that, that just would put off all the entirety of the meal. It doesn't matter how strongly spiced or seasoned the food is, you're going to smell stink on somebody's feet. and Not just toe fungus and things of that sort, all, all kinds of stuff. But the, the disciples, as we saw, what were they busy doing? I'm not going to wash your feet. I'm the greatest amongst us. I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. You, you, you clearly are not the greatest, you need to go wash everybody's feet. They didn't have a servant. They didn't have a slave. In fact, it's in the Old Testament, uh, this, this was the, the most menial of tasks. Only it was reserved for the lowest of slaves. In fact, Jewish slaves were not required to perform this task. Only Gentile slaves were made to wash somebody's feet. Since there was no servant and the 12 were actively arguing over who was the greatest, no one was, no one was going to volunteer to wash everybody's feet. Sure, they, they probably would have said, oh, don't worry, I'll wash Jesus' feet, but nobody else's. Thus, supper began without everyone's feet being washed. 
They were laying there with unwashed feet, stinky, dirty, filthy. So we see first here that love, love is not afraid of humility. What does Jesus do? This is, this is astounding. He stands up from the table. He takes off his outer garment, his outer cloak, and he sets it aside. He takes it and lays it down. And you can imagine, everybody's like, well, Jesus, what, what, what are you doing? He takes, he takes a towel and he wraps it around himself like a slave. And they said, Jesus, what are you doing? What, what, what is going on? And he takes a pitcher and a basin and he comes over to each of the disciples and he pours water into the basin and he crouches down and he takes their feet, dips them in the water and washes them clean. And then all that filth and all that disgusting toe gunk He takes the towel that he's girded with and he dries their feet. Because love is not afraid of humility. Love is not afraid to humble itself to say, this is what love is. This is how much I value you. This is what I'm willing to face, what I'm willing to do so that you might be saved. It says the disciples didn't understand it. In fact, Jesus says, look, you're not going to understand this. You don't grasp that the whole point of me coming to earth is not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Love is not afraid of humility. Philippians 2.8, and being found in fashion as a man, Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ loved you so much that he said, I will humble myself because true love is not afraid of humility. Second under the service of the Savior, we see that love is not afraid of service. Love is not afraid of service. Jesus did not just dress as a servant, but he served those who were inferior to him, even his own enemy. He went to Judas. He washed his enemy's feet who was about to, in a short couple hours, betray him. Matthew 5, 44 to 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse them. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you, and persecute you. Jesus put it into action. He said, love is not afraid of service. This was why he came, Matthew 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto or to be served, but to be a minister, to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 7, but he made himself of no reputation. This is Christ. And took upon him the form of a servant and was found and was made in the likeness of men. Oh, what an amazing display of love. We see love is not afraid of humility. Love is not afraid of service. And love is not afraid of appearing weak. Love is not afraid of appearing weak because love knows true strength. Love knows true strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. Charity, or love, suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's love. Love is true strength. It was unheard of in both Roman and Jewish culture for a superior to crouch low and to serve an inferior. 
It was never done. In doing so, you would show weakness. You would say, oh, well, you're not fit to be the superior because you're taking care of those younger than you, those less than you. You are showing your inferiority, and therefore you're going to be removed from your position. It's a sign of weakness. How then could Christ do this? Because he loved those to whom he was ministering. It takes true strength to bow oneself in humility and serve. It takes true love to place their needs above your own. This is Paul's plea in the start of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like Minded, having the same love, being of one accord. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man also unto the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and came in the fashion of a man. What an amazing display of humility, of love. That's how much God loves us. So much so that he would send his son, not just to wash somebody's stinky feet, but to live amongst us, to keep his perfect law, to die as the sacrifice for the payment of the penalty of their sins. So we might have hope. So we might have that joy of resurrection that we might be gathered around His throne for all of time singing His praises. He loves us so much that He would not let us die in our sins but came to rescue us. Dave Simmons in his book, Dad, the Family Coach, recounts the tale of their family motto being put into action. He writes this, I took Ellen, Helen, eight years old, and Brandon, five years old, to the Cloverleaf Mall in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to do a little shopping. This, is, this was obviously not today. This was a while ago. Because as we drove up, we spotted a Peterbilt 18-wheeler parked with a big sign on it that said, Petting Zoo. The kids jumped up in a rush and asked, Daddy, Daddy, can we go? Please, please, can we go? Sure, I said, flipping them both a quarter before walking into Sears. Like I said, this was a while ago. They bolted away and I felt free to take my time looking for a scroll saw. A petting zoo consists consists of a portable fence erected in the mall with about six inches of sawdust and a hundred little furry baby animals of all kinds. Kids pay their money and stay in the enclosure enraptured with the squirmy little creatures while their moms and dads shop. A few minutes later, I turned around and saw Helen walking behind me. I was shocked to see she preferred the hardware department to the petting zoo. Recognizing my error, I bent down and asked her what was wrong. She looked up at me with those giant lipid brown eyes and said, Well, Daddy... It cost 50 cents, so I gave Brandon my quarter. Then she said the most beautiful thing I have ever heard. She repeated the family motto. The family motto is love is action. She had given Brandon her quarter, and no one loves cuddly, furry creatures more than Helen. She had watched both my wife and I do this and say, love is action for years around the house and the ranch. She had heard and seen love is action and now she had incorporated it into her lifestyle. It had become a part of her. What do you think I did? Well, not what you might think. As soon as I finished my errands, I took Helen to the petting zoo. We stood by the fence and watched Brandon go crazy, petting and feeding the animals. Helen stood with her hands and chin resting on the fence and just watched Brandon. I had 50 cents burning a hole in my pocket. I never had offered it to Helen, and she never asked for it. Because she knew the whole family motto. It's not love is action. 
It's love is sacrificial action. Love is sacrificial, sacrificial action. Love always pays a price. Love always costs something. Love is expensive. When you love, benefits accrue to the other's account. Love is for you, not for me. Love gives, it doesn't grab. Helen gave her quarter to Brandon and wanted to follow through with her lesson. She knew she had to taste the sacrifice. She wanted to experience that total family motto, love is sacrificial action. That's Christ. That's Christ going to his disciples as the humble servant and showing humility. The God of the universe who upholds everything by the word of his power, kneeling and washing his creature's feet. That's love. That's how we ought to be. Love is not afraid of humility. Love is not afraid of service. And love is not afraid of appearing weak because love knows what true strength is. Aren't you thankful for a God that loves you? A God that loves you enough to sacrifice for you. We then ought to love others in the same manner. We need to leave here this morning and go love the world just as God loves the world. To reach out to the lost and the hurting, the broken, the needy with the love of Christ and say, I will sacrifice for you and share with you the good news of the gospel because it's what has been done to me. Someone loved you enough to share the truth with you. Let's go and do the same. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for how much you loved us. We thank you for your sacrificial love is action. That you could not leave us as sinners dying and going to hell, but that you sent your son to die in our place, bearing our sins upon his own body so we might have redemption through him. Father, we thank you for that love. May we go forth and share that love with others. If someone needs to come this morning to, to kneel and to rededicate their lives to sharing that love, may they do so today, Lord. If they need to come and make this place their church home, may they do so, Lord. If they need to come for any other reasons, know that we are here for them. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turn. Service tonight is at 6 o'clock. We're back in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We can finish out chapter 3. Let's go and love. Marty, would you close us in prayer? Yes. And Lord, we just pray that as we realize that and, and we um, internalize it, that we would then go out and show that love to others as well, beginning in our own homes and then with our friends and neighbors and then anyone else you bring in our pathway. I pray that you would just um, bless us today and, and guide us in all of your ways. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.